Well, welcome everybody. I um, am going to try to run the PowerPoint and run um, the cards on the table for you while I'm talking. So hopefully this is all gonna go smoothly. But it's a really weird format we have where like you're watching me and I can't see you. So if I'm talking too fast or if I am not talking about the stuff that you're interested in, please send us a little chat that tells me to slow down or tells me that they, you want me to cover something specific so that I've got some feedback and I am meeting what you, um, your needs are like what you wanted to learn about today. So I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about um, tarot. So um, tarot cards, some people think they're fortune telling cards, um, but I really like to think about them in terms of um, intuition, insight, and connection rather than sort of divination, right? There's sort of the Trelawney, the Professor Trelawney model where um, you can see the future or something like that. But to me, tarot is more about using your intuition and having a tool to give you some insight into um, either to yourself or to somebody else. Um, and it also is a really nice way to form connections with people. As you start reading for people, um, you'll find that it's a way to get to know them and to really for them to share things about themselves um, that they wouldn't otherwise do. So I find it to be a really nice, um, a nice way to connect with people as well as being able to tap into my own intuition. So, would it, yeah, so you know, you often see sort of the fortune teller reading tarot kind of things. I don't really see it as fortune telling. I really see it much more as sort of a gateway into, um, into your psyche. So I guess the first thing that people always have questions about really is about how to pick a deck. So I use a very traditional deck. I actually um, keep it wrapped in this little piece of yellow cloth here. Um, I use a very traditional deck because this is what I learned on. And um, after so many years of using this deck, I have just stayed with it, even though in a lot of ways, it's kind of a problematic deck. Um, it's problematic because it's very white and it's very straight and it's very, um, yeah. So this is called the Rider Waite deck. Um, and it's probably the most common deck that's out there. But I have a lot of other decks, so I thought I would just show you some of my other decks. What you're really looking for in a deck is something that, um, that resonates with you, something that when you look at it, you um, you you look at it, and you're like, oh, this is great. This really speaks to me. So here, for example, is um, an indigenous deck. Um, you can see all of the art is done um, by an indigenous artist, and then. Um, what else do I have? I have um, this deck, which is the Tarot of Love deck. Um, I have this one is part, it's a smaller deck. It doesn't have a full deck of cards. It only has what we call the Major Arcana, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. It's actually the Rosicrucian deck, which comes from the uh, group of folks uh, that whose spiritual class they call themselves the Rosicru Rosicrucians. Um, so there's this one. There's another one called the Mother Peace deck, which is actually round. So that's a little bit different than um, the other ones. And then here's another one that belongs to somebody in my family. And this deck also wrapped up in a little piece of red cloth um, has very similar to the Rider Waite deck, but actually has a more renaissance -y kind of art. Um, so it's kind of a fancy deck that way. It's kind of gold and shimmery. And then I have probably my fanciest deck is the, um, I have a Salvador Dali deck that actually, I don't know if you can really see the shimmer, but there's gold there on the, on the edges of the um, cards. And then the artwork is very Salvador Dali, as you can see. Yeah, so you want to start looking at decks and see what resonates with you and what you like. Um, there, when you first start out, there are some decks that, don't have any words or numbers on them and you're, you need to actually know everything uh, much better in order to do that deck. These are some examples of those um, on the screen here. Um, there's all kinds of decks. There's cat decks for people that love cats. There's mermaid decks, there's neon decks. This one down in the lower right has um, skeletons on it. So um, lots of different things. There are less problematic decks out there. You can see here um, some examples of different races and there are queer decks that you might be interested in, um, in as well. Uh, there's also 
Uh, there are queer decks by people of color that have a variety of themes to them. There are a couple of decks out there that are um, cross-cultural and that are um, more inclusive decks that you might look at. This is called the Modern Witches deck. Um, it's one of the few that actually has uh, representations across cultures. If you don't have access to a deck, you can make your own deck by printing out off the, off the, uh, off the internet. Uh, if you just Google print your own tarot deck, you can print them out and then you can color them yourselves or you can print them out in color if you want to do it that way. It's kind of a, a fun option. There's no reason you have to have a fancy deck to start. Um, and you can even use a playing deck, uh, a playing card deck if you want. And I will talk a little bit about that as we go through. That's a really hard way to start though, because um, it doesn't, the cards themselves will not give you any clues into their meaning. So once you've picked your deck, and I, as I demonstrate, I'm just gonna use my, um, my deck. Um, Marina, we have a few questions about decks actually. Is it okay if I toss them out there to you? Um, so someone was asking if you have the fountain deck. If I have a fountain deck? Yeah. I do not. I do not have the fountain deck. I have the Rider Waite deck, and then I have those other ones that I showed you. But I don't have that particular deck. There are thousands of decks, and so if you have found a deck that resonates for you, that when you're when you're looking at them, you're like, yeah, I like this art. I really like. I like what's depicted here. Then that's the deck for you. It's sort of like a wand in Harry Potter, right? Like the deck might pick you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, right? that's awesome. I also, selfishly, I love to hear, I have a six-year-old and I've been thinking about how to introduce tarot to her and I love knowing that there's the option to print out and color de a deck, which I think is going to be a really fun way to get her involved. Um, we also have another question kind of about your own story. How did you get involved in tarot reading um, and kind of what was your introduction to this? Oh, that's a good question. I haven't thought about that in a really long time. Um, so I had a job where I was working with kids and um, one of the moms of the kid owned a little shop that sold tarot cards and a lot of other things. And I just kind of wandered in there and really liked it. And there was some workshops there and tons of books. And I just, um, I just started back then. Okay. This was a really long time ago. There was no internet. Okay. So I had to read books. And so I just started acquiring books and she would often give them to me or I would buy them at the store. And then she was, she just liked me. So she let me crash basically every course that there was there. And then over the years, I just, I just read stuff. I'm really mostly self-taught and then just sort of, um, have, you know, done a lot of readings over the years. So that's really how you learn is just by doing a lot of readings. Awesome. That's, that's so cool to know. Um, and it's, I know I'm really excited that this can be also an introduction for so many folks on this call to tarot reading. So just thanks again for, for hanging out with us and spending some time and I'll let you get back to the setting intention. Yeah, no, I'm happy to have questions. Keep them coming. Awesome, thanks. So this is sort of this in setting your intention or your space. And there are some people that think you have to do something really fancy, right? So you'll see this a lot in terms of you know, when you read a lot of books, it'll be like, okay, you have to face to the West when you're reading, um, unless you're trying to do a, you know, this certain type of reading, then you need to face to the North, or you have to have this type of table that's made out of this type of wood, or you have to have candles or fancy rings, or you can see on my tabletop, I do have a crystal here, and I have some rocks that I've acquired over the years, but I really just don't think you need all of that. Most of the reason, most of the readings that I do are like at a picnic table with a cloth down just so that the cards don't get damaged. You don't really need something special. But at the same time, you want to have, you want to be in your intention, right? So you want to set up a specific, you want to set up a specific space and that you're thinking about ahead of time. So you're sort of in that spiritual space. You're in that intuitive space where you're, um, where you're able to really focus on what you're doing. And so I think the sort of ritual of having a specific space um, can set that up for people, but I don't think that it's really, um, that it's really actually necessary. So yeah, I like this little picture here because, uh, because it's from The Simpsons, right? Um, 
So once you sort of have a deck of cards and you have a space to lay out the cards, the next question is about your spread. Like how do you put the cards out on the table? So this is a this here in front of um, of the Simpson character is um, a five card spread, which is fairly common. But I think when you're starting, um, you're probably better off starting with what is called the traditional three card spread, where you've got you're going to put three cards in front of you, one for the past, one for the future, and one for the present. So what you'll do, you'll shuffle your cards, shuffle, 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 however you want to do that. I'm really careful when I shuffle them. I don't ever want to bang them. I've had the same deck now for more than 30 years. So I'm pretty gentle. I don't bang them on the table like this to straighten them. I don't shuffle them like they're a deck of cards. I shuffle them like this and I make sure that I take them apart and that I turn them so that some of them are upside down and some are right side up. And once you're done shuffling, cut the deck in some way. Some people cut them in threes, like you might go one, two, three, like that. Um, and then put them together in a different order. Doesn't really matter how you do it. You might want to have a ritual where you do it the same way every time, but you might just do it different every time until you find something. So a three card spread, you're just going to have three cards in front of you like that. And there's your spread, right? Past, present, future. You can ask a specific question or you can just have a sort of a life reading. So this is a really good spread to start with, just the simple three card spread. There's lots of fancy ones. Here's um, one that I found on the internet that has different um, positions. And you can see on the screen, like card one, so that's the card that has the one on it, has a specific um, has a specific meaning down at the bottom. And you can find lots of these spreads on, up until you find the ones that you're most comfortable with. Um, and then this is probably the most common one um, that I see. Uh, it's called the Celtic Cross, and there's many variations of this one, but this is a very common one. And those are all, you can just Google those on the internet and find them. So in terms of the card deck, um, each deck is broken into two cards, into two decks, sorry. And they, um, each, each deck is independent of each other, really. Uh, the first is the major arcana, and the second is the minor arcana. So you can see here I have uh, one of the cards, one of my favorite cards is called the Empress, comes out of the major arcana. And you can see how different decks represent the same card in different ways, right? Um, and then there's the minor arcana. The minor arcana uh, basically mimics the plain deck of cards. And again, you can see different decks that have very different um, representations but similar themes to the same this is the queen of pentacles card okay so the major arcana these cards the major arcana of course the word arcana means mystery or secret and so the major arcana is is when those cards come up they're revealing major um they're they're representing major secrets major mysteries things that are really weighty things that are really important these are things that are big lessons or things that are, if it's about your, uh, a card about you, it's something that's really important about you or for you. Um, so yeah, so these cards, there's, they can be laid out in this way of a, an infinity symbol. And if you look at them, they sort of, they sort of show a progression of different phases of, um, of existence. And you can see here that um, there are some cards that people consider to be quote unquote bad cards. So some of those are like the devil card, which we actually just saw come up. Oh, now I put it somewhere, but the devil card, oh, here it is. That devil card comes up and it's, um, some people see that as a negative card or, oops, sorry. Um, yeah, the devil card sometimes Right? It's a card about, um, about having things that are trying to pull you off your life's path. And similarly, the death card, people think, oh my gosh, what if the death card comes up? Well, the death card is really, should be called something more like transformation, because of course, death is the ultimate transformation, changing from one, um, from one body, you know, having that body change by dying, it's transforming into something else. So having um, the death card really means that there's big changes, big transformations ahead. 
Uh, the other card that sometimes people see as the negative card is the um, is the tower, which is another card about you're, you're not listening to the signs around you. You're not following your intuition. There's something about the path that you're on that you need to be redirected. So that's the major arcana. Some decks only have a major arcana. And when you're first learning, this can be a really nice way to start. When you're not, when you haven't learned all of the cards in the entire deck, start with the major arcana, 22 cards, and um, use a deck or take a full deck and just pull out those cards so that you're only using those until you learn them, because it makes it a lot easier to be able to memorize the, um, the meanings for those. So the minor arcana, um, each card in the minor arcana, with the exception of four of them, um, is the same as a card in the playing deck. So when I was saying earlier that you can use your regular playing deck of cards as tarot cards, this is what I'm referring to. I'm referring to using the minor arcana. So you can see that the cups card on the, on the screen here, we've got the four of cups. The cups represent water and emotions. And in the playing deck, it's the hearts, right? Because they're also the emotion cards. So when you get a cups card, when you get a hearts card, we're really talking about something that's going on with the with your emotional world. Um, but so there's there's the, the cards that are ace through ten, and then um, in the tarot deck we have pages, knights, jacks, and queens and kings right and then in um the playing cards we only have jacks queens and kings so um yeah so there's an extra card in the tarot deck in each of the suits so the suits um each have a meaning there's swords wands cups and pentacles and then of course there's the numbers which is the ace through king so you can get a chart like this which is a very very uh, succinct cheat sheet. It's definitely an oversimplification of those cards. Each of these cards is something that you can study for hours. There are hundreds of books out there written. There is so much information on the internet. Um, but you can, for each card, you can learn about a lot of different things. We'll talk about that in a minute. But there's, you can also use this kind of a cheat sheet when you're starting. And you'll see that the numbers each have a meaning as well. And so when you when you overlay the number with the suit, you start to see those meanings. So for example, ace is new beginnings. It's sort of that spirituality, the new something that's new, um, novel, those types of things. So when you have when we talk about the cups, when you have that uh, ace of cups, you're talking about new love. You're talking about that sort of new relationships, creative things, creative thought, those types of things, that really falls into that Ace of Cups when you see that come up. The Ace of Pentacles has to do, Pentacles, of course, that corresponds to diamonds because it's the material world. So it includes career, money, uh, access to resources, property, things like that. Um, so when you have the Ace of Pentacles, Ace of Coins, Ace of Diamonds, you're looking at sort of manifesting new resources, right? New I, new careers, new jobs, sort of prosperity, those types of things. New money, that kind of thing is the Ace of Pentacles. And you can see how this goes on for each um, for each suit and then for each number. And this is just a little chart that I got off the internet. There's several different ones out there. Um, oh, I did forget to tell you one other thing. Each of your decks, if you buy a new deck, you will see um that they typically come with a little booklet like this this is my dally one um and the little booklet has for each card what the what the artist oh you can't really see that too well let me be a little bit what the artist is telling you that the artist thinks the that the card means um that doesn't mean that it has to mean that for you it's just the artist's interpretation and every tarot reader is going to have their own interpretation of each card Here's another one. I have the uh, another example of that little book that you can get. Some of the books also have little spreads in the back. Can you see that? I'm hoping you can see that at least a little bit um, that describe how they do that. Um, and so again, those are just ideas that the um, that the artist is giving you. Awesome. We have a few more questions. 
Yeah, uh, let's do it. Awesome. So we have a question on, we know that your deck is very special to you and you've had it for a long time. Have you, do you have a favorite deck? Is it the deck that you've had for a long time or? Oh, my, I have so many favorite decks, but I really love my Salvador Dali deck. Um, I found this at a little bookshop, a little basement bookshop in Boulder, Colorado. And there was a limited number of them that were printed that have the gold on the edge. Um, and I just got really lucky and I just love it. I just think the art is very unusual. Um, and, but they're just really, it's not even, it's collage. So he actually did the collage of them. A lot of them have him represented in them. Um, but they're just kind of a really pretty amazing artist uh, rendition of the deck. Here's, for example, um, the tower card, which I just, how do I, oh, there we go. Um, it's just really a powerful, um, powerful card. So yeah, um, I don't really have a favorite deck. Um, there's just so many, and at different times of my life, I've been drawn to different ones. Like there was a time where I really liked the um, the mother piece deck, uh, the yeah the mother piece I think is what it's called deck. Um, but I haven't used that lately. It was just a time in my life when that really resonated with me. Um, I think that as we become sort of more aware of social justice issues and oppression, um, I'm more unhappy with a lot of the decks. Um, that traditionally we didn't really think about that. We we thought about it more in terms of the archetypes and less about um about what we just didn't think that way right so now i look at this deck and i sometimes and i'm just sort of horrified at, at how white it is and how um how cis-centric it is i mean it's just there's it's problematic on many levels and yet it's the one that i know very very well and i can interpret it um, with those layers there but if i was starting over now i think i would look probably more at something like um, I like that modern witches deck. I'm not crazy about that name, but um, I think I would do a lot more research and look for something that's a little bit more like that. Some of them are some of them are really lovely decks, but I'm not sure it solves the problem to have a deck that is like the Japanese American deck, which is done by a Japanese American artist. But all of the all of the characters then are Japanese American. I think I would be looking for a deck that is more diverse and represents a lot of different um, aspects of um, aspects of our culture or society now, right? Like it just seems like that's the way I would go. Absolutely. Did you have another? Yeah, I have a uh, two more. So, do you have? I know you mentioned the Empress, but do you have a a favorite card or a card that kind of has spoken to you in a big way throughout your life? Well, those are two really different questions. <laughs> I think the card that has spoken the most to me over my life is the tower. This is a card that I um, that I see a lot in spreads that I when I read for myself. Um, and the tower is just a reminder that you're not paying attention to the bigger picture. That you're supposed to be on a road like you've got a life. Um, that you're there, there, there's a purpose to life. And if you've got the tower card showing up, you're not you're not listening to that. You're not on the right path. And if you don't redirect yourself, something else in the universe is going to come in and sort of hit the reset button for you. It's actually kind of interesting, right? We're right in the middle of this pandemic. So you can kind of see the cow the tower card is like the pandemic card. <laughs> like our entire community was not on the right path. And the tower card is like, hello, I have been sending you all these smoke signals. I've been telling you for ages, hello, hello, pay attention. You are not on the right path. And we were not listening. And so it's like, okay, you're not listening. I'm going to do this for you. And if you look at the card, and I don't know if you can really see it here, but you can look at it online later. Um, you can see the symbolism of that. Like, okay, these folks, they built this gigantic tower on the top of this hill. Like, that was not a good idea. Like, totally. I don't think that was earthquake safe. <laughs> it's just, it was not really what they should have been doing. And if they had been listening, they probably could have listened to their intuition and thought that wasn't a good idea. But because they didn't listen, now you're seeing, you know, the storm with the lightning that has caught it on fire and they're now falling out on their way to something new. Somebody, something else, some other power came in and had to reset them because they didn't listen. Mm. Right. The, the tower card speaks to me a lot, um, and, but not my favorite card because I never want to hear it. <laughs> doing it the right way, right? Absolutely. But there are 
cards that I love. Like I, there's an example of the Queen of Pentacles. Um, this is somebody that's able to, um, that has what they need and they have enough to share and they're willing to share it. So it's abundance, but also connection with the earth. And so it's abundance that's sort of right share. Yeah. Other questions? Um, I can just go through cards that I love. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for a whole hour, I'm sure. Um, yeah. One other question. And I could I'll... do like. Go. Oh, sorry. Um, one other question was when you do a, a reading, is there um, is there a timing? Like, would you do it in response to a circumstance in your life or just do you kind of do them every so often? Well, that's a good question. I'm going to hold that and come back to that in just a couple minutes because I have one more slide and then I think the next slide answers that question. So if I don't answer it, let's come back to it. So Jesse, will you Jess, will you put a um, in it? Absolutely. All right. Another one? That's it for now, but I'm sure they'll keep rolling in. Okay, so when you are looking at the cards, there's a variety of different ways that you can interpret the cards and sort of they, they're kind of like tricks that you can learn um, to memorize the cards so that you know what they all mean. And depends on what you're interested in, um, which ones are going to resonate for you, which ones you're going to want to learn. So one is the numerology of the cards. So numbers in um, sort of in occult theory, numbers all have meanings. And so um, as you as you learn the numerology behind the cards, it's much easier to interpret the cards because you know when then one comes up, that means that it's something new, right? So there, each of those are going to um, are going to show up in that way. There's the mythology behind the cards. If you like Greek or Roman mythology, you are going to love these cards because so many of them um, correspond to mythological stories, right? Uh, a lot of the cards have astrology uh, background to them, and I am not an astrologist and I don't know very much about astrology, but they, um, a lot of them correspond to signs of the zodiac, and you can find a lot of the symbolism from that uh, from that tradition in the cards. I'm looking for the high priestess. I don't know if I can quickly find it, but um, it has a lot of those astrological symbols on it. And I can't, can't quickly find it, but in any event, you can look for those um, astrological symbols in many different cards and some decks. Oh, in fact, I have one right here. Um, I have this deck somebody gave me that is not for me because it is based on astrology, but I nevertheless have the deck. And you can see this particular deck is all about astrology. And it's not a traditional tarot deck at all. It has a whole different to, to, to reading them. But it's a, based completely in um, astrology. Um, okay. Then psychology. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of articles, books, stories, interesting information out there about um, the psychology of the cards, and particularly in Jungian psychology. So if you're interested in psychology um, and you're interested in cards, I really recommend reading that because it'll also give you a lot of insight into a lot of the different cards. There's lots of symbolism. So if you're like literature, you'll see a lot of the sort of symbology that you learn about in literature, you'll find that in the cards as well. And of course, the archetypes, you'll see those everywhere. And even color theory, if you're an artist and you're interested in the meaning of colors and things like that, then you will find a lot of that um, in these decks as well. Okay, so reading the cards. So how do you actually go about reading the cards, right? Um, the best thing to do is to practice. Like you just have to practice so much. So what I really recommend when you very first start is to do a daily card. So you get up in the morning and you shuffle, or you can do it right before bed, whatever. But you um, shuffle the cards, and then maybe you cut the deck, and then you pull a card for the day. You can pull it off the top, you can pull it off the minute. Oh, look at that. There's that Queen of Pentacles. I didn't shuffle very well because I just pulled out one of my favorites, right? But you can pull out a card each day and sort of have it be a theme for the day. So you start off by reading about the card. Um, either in your little, uh, in, in the little booklet that came with your cards, you might start with that. You might, if you printed out your own deck, you might start out on um, the internet and read something about that. 
I really recommend reading from several different sources. So if you have a book and then you have maybe two sources on the internet and then you have your own the little book that came with your, your deck, read what different people think about the card because different people are gonna interpret it very, very differently. And what you're looking for is your own interpretation. And so you wanna make sure that you understand the cards well enough. So if you're pulling one card a day, eventually you're gonna get yourself through the entire deck. And if you're thinking about that card and resonating with each one card each day, you're gonna start really learning the deck so that when you read, you don't need to refer to anything else. And that's really the goal is to be relying completely on your intuition and not having to look for something else. So that daily card is a great way to do that. You can even just walk around the house with your family and your household, um, the people that you are quarantined with, you walk around and just say, hey, pick a card and then have them pick a card for the day. What's their card for the day? King of Swords, let's talk about King of Swords. And then you do the same thing. You're like, oh, well, this is what I think it means. And then go and look up four or five different things and talk about it and think, well, how does that play into my day? And how does that play into my life right now? And that way you're gonna be more inclined to actually learn what the card is. So I love that daily card um, approach. I have a friend who's been reading cards maybe about 10 years and he still pulls a card every day. Um, he, he sets an intention for the day based on the card. So it's kind of a fun little tradition that he does. Okay, so the next thing you can do is you can read for yourself. And you can do this again, either um, with, uh, with a manual or a book or with several, or you can just do it with your own intuition. One thing that I might suggest is you read just that simple three card spread, past, present, future. And you first look at the cards, think about your intuition and how that, what do you think those cards mean? When you look at those, what are you thinking? Is that one? Okay. Um, what are you thinking? What do you, what, what does they, what do they mean to you? And then go look them up and then see, okay, well, this person disagrees with what my intuition says, but this other person agrees. And so that's a really good way, again, to sort of build up to learning, um, to learning the deck. Again, if you don't have a deck at home, you can use the playing card deck and just use those, which is the minor arcana. If you want to, if you want to learn more quickly or you want to, you don't think you can handle the entire deck to start, just pull out these major arcana cards. In my deck, you can tell which ones those are because they have the large, the name on the bottom, and then they have the number on top, as opposed to the minor arcana one, which just has the number, and then you can tell that the suit is there. Uh, when you're reading a spread like this, as opposed to a daily card, um, there's a couple of different things to keep in mind. One is the major arcana cards have more weight. They're more important. They're the ones that you're going to want to pay the most attention to. You also look at whether the card is reversed, so upside down to you or right side up to you. Um, the many, most, most, I would say probably most, um, tarot readers interpret the cards differently based on whether they are right side up or reversed. Um, and so you're going to want to take that into account. Typically when a card is reversed, it means that you're not tapping into that energy. You're having a hard time with that lesson or it's impacting you in some type of a negative way. And when it's right side up, it's something that's easier for you. It's something that resonates more with you. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how you do that. Um, once you get a little bit better and you've got the cards there, you start reading for families and family and friends. Um, and again, this is something that I um, would start with a very simple three card spread like this. And then after you do the reading, once you feel like, okay, I can do this for somebody else, I would do the reading and then do it from your intuition. And then afterwards, if you're like, oh, I'm not quite sure if I remembered how that five of wands, what that really meant. Go back afterwards if you feel like you didn't do as good a job with that card. And again, read many different sources about that one card until you really feel comfortable that the next time that five of um, wands comes up, you're going to have a better, um, a better sort of understanding of the card. Yeah, hopefully that makes sense for folks. Um, yeah, and then you can graduate. Um, and so then you might, once, you, once you're really interested in it, that's a time when you want to be looking at reading entire books, right? There's entire books just on different spreads. There's books on 
um, just the major arcana and the psychology of it. There's books on just the numerology or just the astrology or just a specific deck. So those are all, um, yeah, those are all things that you can um, do once you sort of get into it. I think some of the more esoteric books are difficult to start with because some of them are really um, abstract and it's hard to just read sort of a definition of a card and then another definition of a card and then another definition of a card. Reading that start to end, um, I think can be pretty difficult. But one of the things that I also like doing uh, for those types of books is uh, getting it on audio and listening to it sort of while I'm out for a walk or while I'm doing the laundry or doing other chores that I don't necessarily like. Um, I'll uh, listen to one on audio. The libraries often on their free audio downloads will have those. And you can just listen to what one person's interpretation of the entire deck is. So those are the things that I wanted to make sure we covered. Um, once you've sort of mastered this, uh, the, the easy spread, then I think you move on to those more complicated spreads. Um, that we looked at, I'll just flip through these slides real quick, and you can see something more like the Celtic Cross or um, a year ahead type of a spread. Are there other questions for me? Awesome. Well, we had a question about kind of the best way to start practicing, and I feel like you really covered that starting um, with picking a card a day and then uh, the three cards for yourself and maybe for your family. So I think that covered that question, we have another one. What is your favorite thing about tarot card reading? Uh, for me, the, my favorite thing is, um, is really being able to connect with other people. Um, it really is a lovely way to open up a conversation with somebody about their life and to gain some insight into their life in a way that even if you're just, even if you're really open and you're talking to somebody um, they wouldn't necessarily um, tell you the things that when you're when you're reading for them and you're able to really tap into that intuition and sort of open that door or look in that window, whatever metaphor you want to use. Um, it's a way to be able to to really be to really be in somebody's life with them, to really be to really share an experience with them. And that's definitely, definitely my favorite part. Awesome. Other questions? None at the moment. Um, so I, I think, we're, we're, yeah, go for it. I was just going to say, um, I can show you how I would do a full reading. Um, obviously, I don't have a person that I'm doing it for, and I'm not in sort of that intuitive space with the video and paying attention to the camera. But I can definitely show you the basic spread if folks are interested in that and you think that would be helpful. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, I've got to move things a little bit out of the way and we'll see if I can get it on the camera here. Okay, so this is um, what I, this card I place as called the significator card, which is a card that um, represents your inner self or your, um, your core, the part of yourself that doesn't change over time. Um, that's, that's um, yeah, that, that's what really the significator card is. And so the hanged man is a major arcana. So if I was reading for somebody and they got um, this card as their core self, I would be telling them that they that um, that the, the hanged man is very much about waiting for something to happen. You know that there's times in your life where you're working really hard towards something and there's you're doing a lot of things and you feel like you're moving ahead. And then there's other times where it feels like you're not accomplishing. Oh, kind of like the pandemic. It feels like we're accomplishing nothing. <laughs> We're just holding still and waiting for something to happen to us. So that's kind of how, um, that's kind of the hangman, is the, that place in your life where you're just waiting. Um, and the lesson here is that when you're waiting, what you're waiting for isn't what's important. It's the actual waiting in and of itself that is what's important. So when you get that hangman, if you have that sense of feeling like you're not getting anywhere, the reminder here is that you you're getting somewhere, you just don't see it. This time that you're holding still or that you're waiting, that's what the important part of it. So the next card that I read on after that is um, what I was called the cover. This is what's covering you. Um, so this is the energy that is surrounding you right now. Um, 
so the hermit would be um, the nine of the major arcana. Um, the hermit is a card of loneliness, but not always in a negative way. It's loneliness, but it's also um, the ability to be self-reliant and not need other people to um, rely on you, uh, to, for you to rely on. Um, so both of these cards are reversed. And so if we think about pandemic times, this is another one, for example, I'm really struggling with the sense of being uh, isolated and feeling that loneliness. And so having that as a cover is that um, it's, it's, it's the energy that's around me is that sense of being, of uh, being disconnected or being on my own. But it's also that reminder that I have that self-reliance within me. Because it's reversed, it's kind of one of those lessons I don't want to learn. I don't like it. I'm not good at it. So that, that really resonates with me at the moment anyhow. The next card that I read in this Celtic cross would be um, a card that's crossing you. Um, it's what's getting in your way or standing in the way. King of Wands is, um, so the kings typically represent um, masculine energy. And um, again, these are really stereotypical cards, but you sort of, you, you think about those stereotypes in terms of that masculine energy. And the wands um, have to do with uh, endeavors and um, energy. And so having a king of wands is really about um, rooting your energy, finding a way to make, to um, get your ideas grounded, to make them reality and to be able to really function in that, to take your nervous energy or your extra energy and put it into something that is productive in the real sort of materialistic kind of the world. So this is what's um, behind you. Um, I have to move over this way a little bit to make sure that gets on the screen. There we go. Um, this is what's behind you. So this represents what um, the sort of phase of your spiritual, uh, sorry, the phase of your material life that's behind you. So if you think of all life as phases that you come in and out of, this would be the phase that you're coming out of. So the page of wands, um, this has to do with um, sort of being really interested in things, learning new things, um, yeah, sort of observing things. Um, so it's a period of observance. And then we have what crowns you. Um, so this is what um, what is ahead for you spiritually. Um, so the Wheel of Fortune is an interesting card because it has to do with chance. It has to do with luck and things that you don't necessarily get to um, things that you don't necessarily get to control. So that's sort of what you're working with. This, this position would be what you're working on next in terms of spiritual energy. And then what's beneath you is going to be what, um, if you look at this cross, this direction is sort of the spiritual world and this direction is the material world. So this direction here, um, this is going to be sort of what your life so far has taught you in terms of um, spiritual lessons. So somebody that has the devil in this position would be somebody who really struggled with distraction. So it might be addiction. It might be um, somebody who has ADD, somebody who's ADHD, somebody who's very distractible, um, somebody who's had a hard time figuring out their path in life and has jumped around and done many different things. That would be sort of their, um, their background. And so they're moving into something now that they don't have a lot of control in. And this spread has a lot of major arcana cards so far. We've already got, um, so far we've already got four cards there. And then this represents the path ahead. We've got my card here that I really like, this Queen of Pentacles in terms of the abundance. And so that would be looking forward in the material world. You'd be thinking about somebody who's on the right track in terms of building abundance and, um, yeah, building abundance and material wealth. So and being having enough that they're able to share. So that's kind of a nice space to have that. So that's how I would start a spread. Um, you can add different cards. There's often a column here with different positions on the side of that Celtic cross. But that's kind of how you start reading them like that. Do I have other questions? There are no questions at the moment, but if folks have questions on doing a reading and what we just saw, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, and thank you for doing that. That was really eye-opening for me and I feel really inspired to 
Um, we have a deck in our house that belongs to my partner from when her younger years. So I'm kind of inspired to go break it out and um, start our daily picking. Excellent. Yeah. Um, well, while any final questions are trickling in, I just want to say a really huge thank you to you, Lorena. This was amazing. Um, you answered all of the questions that we've had so far and just adding kind of this skill, um, bringing this skill to our families is such a huge, um, it's a, such a huge joy. And we do have another question. Oh, what is your favorite spread to do? Okay, so I do, um, I typically do a variation of the Celtic cross spread that I have developed myself. So um, yeah, there's a number of books out there on creating spreads or different spreads. And so I spent a, a significant period of time learning about all the different spreads that were out there. And so I've combined a couple of them. Um, it looks similar to the one that's on the slide up here, except that I've added a second column uh, which would be to the to the right of seven, eight, nine, ten. Another column of four there, plus a top one on the very top of those ones. That so that would be eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. A number fifteen that resides on ten and fifteen. Um, and I really developed that because I felt like seven, eight, nine, and ten here are really two two pronged pieces. And so it gives you extra data, extra things to work with in terms of, you know, hopes and fears are a great example. It has listed here. This spread reads number, what is that? Number nine as hopes and fears. And so I read what would be nine and 11, 12, 13, nine and 13. I read those one as hope and one as fear. And then potential future, I've moved that. That's up at number 15. So I just played around with it a little bit and do it slightly differently. Um, actually, ha, huh, look at that. I have a little cheater sheet here <laughs> from when I did that. Can you see that OK? Yeah. So it doesn't have to be fancy, right? Like just over the years, you sort of start thinking about like, OK, when I read this, I feel like I'm not getting enough information on this card. And so I really wanted to flesh that out a little bit. So I drew my own. And so I've been using that same one for many, many years now. But you really can develop it. And there are so many spreads out there. And then some people really, when you're, when you're reading, sometimes you want to just do a 10-minute reading for somebody. And sometimes you want to do an hour or two by yourself. And those are really different readings, right? There are life spreads where you're throwing 21 cards, and that takes some significant amount of time to look at that. There are other times when you're sitting down with a specific question um, where you're really like, okay, I'm trying to figure out, you know, am I do I want to go to college? Is that or I'm really struggling with that idea? Do I want to do I want to start working right away? Like, what do I want to do? Throwing a spread about that. You're probably looking more like a five card spread that's designed to focus on a specific issue instead of something like this, which is more of a gateway into a whole life story, right? Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, and one other question, what are some of the ways to query a problem or an issue that comes up um, in your reading? Well, yeah, I mean, and that's really that I would really encourage you when you're when you're asking a specific question or you're doing a, you're throwing a spread for a specific reason before you spread and before you throw a spread. And it's really true of every spread, I guess I want to back up is really about setting that intention that really just spend a few minutes sitting where you're going to sit, thinking about what you're doing and then shuffling those cards and really shuffle the cards while you think about it, because it's going to be a more the spread's going to be more useful and it's going to have more depth if you've done some thinking as you're approaching it like what do i how do i really want to ask this question is this really what i'm asking it's it's not the kind of thing for like you know should i go to the prom with joe <laughs> right like that's not really um it, it doesn't work so well for that i mean you could definitely do a three card spread and i've seen people do a three card spread for a question like that where if two cards are upright and one is back is, is reversed, then that's a yes, you should do that. That is not how I work with the cards, but 
there are definitely people that use the cards in that kind of a way. And that's more of a fortune telling kind of an approach, a divination kind of an approach, which is different than what I do. I would be looking at two reversed cards and one card that's um, one card that's upright asking a question about should I be in a relationship with someone? It's sending you a lot of information, but it depends on what those cards are. So yeah, Absolutely. so every card is going to matter. The, the card that's there, whether it's reversed or not, whether it's major or minor arcana, and then whether, um, and then where it is in the spread, right? And then when you get really advanced, you'll start looking at a Celtic spread and you'll start looking at the combination of cards and you'll start seeing, okay, this relates to this, or I can see how this future ahead over the, that this overlaps or that wow, you've got a lot going on here and these relate and wow, there's a lot of wands here. What's going on with all that energy, <laughs> you know? So you'll start to see those types of secondary, you know, sort of when you start leveling up, you start seeing those those um, those next level connections in the cards. Definitely. Hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, I think so. Um, great. Well, this has been such a joy. Um, thank you for all this information. And um, I imagine that everyone on the call is eager to get off and practice, practice, practice. Um, but again, I just want to thank you, Lorena. This has been um, such a joy. And thanks to everyone who participated, all the questions that rolled in that were really thoughtful. Um, and we are just so, awesome. yeah, yeah, yeah. This was a really great, um, a really great time together. and. Um, you know, we record our sessions, so if any of the folks watching um, want to watch again, if they didn't take notes fast enough, um, or if they want to share it with friends and family, it'll be um, posted on our website for folks to kind of reference back to. Um, so thank you so much, Lorena, for spending your afternoon with us and being a part of the neighborhood. Um, I'm just going to share the web address for folks who were participating in case they want to check out the rest of our events. Um, and just really grateful for our presenters and our participants because these programs are made possible by all of you. Um, so thank you so much. Um, Mike, and thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, this was lovely. Um, all right, well, everyone have a really great weekend and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.